99 Lifesavers. Tonight on Lifesavers, the boy in a terrible crash they thought no one could survive. Plus, how to keep kids safe on the road. And the go-kart accident that called on the new skills of two young Lifesavers. When you get into a car, what's the first thing that you do? With most drivers, it's instinctive. You put on your own seat belt. But it's also a legal requirement for drivers to make sure that any children under 14 in the car are also properly restrained. Last year, more than a thousand children, that's the equivalent of an entire school, were killed or seriously injured while they were travelling in cars. According to the Department of Transport, 90% of those deaths and serious injuries could have been avoided if the children had been properly strapped in. More and more parents are buying car seats for their children, but as we'll see later, a survey carried out for Lifesavers revealed that a frightening proportion of them weren't correctly fitted. In our first story tonight, Julie Elliott was careful to make sure that this seat for her two-year-old son Matthew was properly fitted, but she never dreamt it would be put to the ultimate test. The child will rattle around that car like a, an egg in a tin box. There's no doubt whatsoever he would have become a missile inside the vehicle. The consequences of not having them in a, in a, in a car seat, you know, they just don't bear thinking about, really. We had um, a quick fit car seat fitted purely because I was never really that confident that I'd managed to sort of fit the car seat in right. But I always felt more confident with that seat because there was never any sort of play in it right. and Matthew always seemed very secure in it. Matthew and his mother Julie are played by actors. Right, sweetheart, it won't be long now. We'll be home in a minute. I'd had a day out with Matthew. We'd been to the North Yorkshire Moors um, Railway uh, to a Thomas the Tank Engine special. And he'd had a really exciting time. He'd met the fat controller and thought that was absolutely marvellous. It was getting quite late. And he was just sort of dozing off in the, in the back of the car. I, I, I'd swerved before I even realised what I'd done. <laughs> I saw a car um, veer across um, the, from the outside lane of the dual carriageway across the inside lane and then it, it just flew and hit into a tree. The car looks as if no, you know, somebody wouldn't walk away from that accident. The windscreen was missing from the car and the bonnet was up. Some of the windows were smashed and I noticed then that a child was in the, the rear seat of the vehicle. Uh, my immediate thought with them, because I realised he was strapped into a child's seat, was to get him out of the vehicle before I feared it had burst into flames. I was just shocked that you know, a child could not, not only survive something like that but walk away from it unscathed. Mark and Debbie Scrimshaw were next on the scene, unaware that Daryl had already taken okay. Matthew yes, out of the wreckage. Look after his mum. OK, go back. Was, some, was somebody with somebody you? Somebody in the car Matthew. with you. Matthew! Debbie, the seat oh, The child seat was empty. My thoughts were, where was the child? Was the, had the child been thrown from the car? Was it in a ditch somewhere? Or, you know, even worse, was it in the road? It's fine, I've got the boy out of the back, it's fine. So oh. it's with my girlfriend. So oh, he's got, got him out. Where is he? Until I saw him around. myself. I was concerned as a mother. He's fine. He's and fine. having Don't seen worry, him, it was a question of then we'll move on and and help Julie. Keith. Don't worry. Keith, is Keith your partner, your husband? Talking to her, you could yes. almost imagine that she was just trapped and there, there were no injuries. But when I looked down I'm at sure. her legs, I couldn't understand how she could stay so calm talking to me with those injuries. She must have been really suffering. Where is Matthew? Matthew's I think fine. she He's thought that maybe we were just saying he was all right so that she wasn't unduly concerned. And until she saw him, she wouldn't truly relax. See him, Matthew. 
he was held at a fine. distance so that she could see him and see that he was fine, but he couldn't see her. They're on their way, love. I can hear the sirens. I thought at any time that we would lose her. I couldn't see the blood. I couldn't see that there was anything that I could do, but I was aware that she must be losing a lot, and I just thought any time she could just die. The emergency services arrived within 12 minutes of the accident. A person can bleed to death from one badly fractured femur. Uh, Julie had both legs fractured, so she could have bled to death at, at any time. The policies are that any patient trapped for 20 minutes or more would have to get medical help, a, a medical team from the hospital or a, a local GP. As soon as they finish taking that door off, I'll get around to the other side. The reason I wanted Dr. Bradley is because GPs can administer pain relief, such as morphine, and that's what Julie needed. When she was coming into consciousness, she'd got a lot of pain. Well, I didn't think she'd make it. She looked very, very ill. White, a lot of blood. She was slipping into unconsciousness. I didn't really think she'd live. When a car is that badly smashed and you can see the impact that, uh, that, that, that it's had, um, you expect everybody inside the car to be really damaged. For somebody to walk away, you say it's a miracle in this case. Yeah, it was a bit of a miracle that the kid survived. I bet we can go and see some fire engines or oh, ambulances. Would you like to see those? If Matthew hadn't been secured in that child seat, there's no doubt whatsoever that Matthew would not have survived at all. Once Dr. Bradley had Hello. treated Julie, Hi. she went to check Matthew. What's your name? Is it Matthew? It is Matthew. Yeah, Matthew. He seems absolutely fine. Okay. Yeah, he's great. We've just cut the front porch. It was so difficult because she was uh, badly trapped by the legs and it, it was one of those jobs where you had to take it slowly, although she was critically injured. So you couldn't rush it, but at the same, at the same time, there was a sense of urgency. Postman Pat. I remember thinking that this little boy could lose his mother here, and every minute is a minute too long. They talk about the golden hour. This was a golden two hours plus, and I was very concerned for her. I didn't think she would make it. And my feelings as I was cuddling him were one of, you know, poor little boy, you know, your mother's got to be all right because you need her. Let us through your door. I don't know how she survived that day, waiting patiently in that seat to be cut out. It's just remarkable. She was an incredibly brave lady. Julie spent over three months in hospital. She had a punctured lung, severely fractured legs, and needed skin grafts for an arm injury. I don't think it occurred to me until quite some time afterwards how, how serious it had been and how close I became to either losing my legs or dying. And now I'm very pleased to hear that she's had a little girl and that she's living a normal life. And it's a very, very happy ending. I could have stood anything if, if Matthew was all right. That was the only thing that worried me. That was the only th my, my only concern at the time. I was so determined to get on with the physiotherapy and the surgery and everything, just so that I could look after him and, and take care of him again. And I think that I really worked hard at recovering because, because he was all right and he, and he was there and he needed me. Even if somebody offers me a lift or if I go in, you know, I wouldn't consider going in a taxi unless there was a car seat fitted. Uh, I just don't think they're safe otherwise. I've got a new one now because I'm older and my baby sister has one too. Oh, wow. Because it makes it higher so, so it doesn't go strangling me. Putting a child inside a car and not restraining them is inexcusable. You've got to make sure that the child is properly restrained in a proper seat fitted for the job and therefore the child's safety will come first it's no good you being strapped into the car if the child isn't because when you have an accident it's too late to say sorry when i see children in cars unrestrained 
I just find it quite incredible, really. Um, I couldn't live with myself if I'd have thought that Matthew was injured because of, I, I hadn't strapped him into a car seat. And I, I just don't know how anybody else could either. I mean, if you, if you can afford a car, you can afford a car seat. It isn't just enough to have a car seat. It must be fitted securely into the car. Matthew escaped without a scratch because his was. But a survey published today by the RAC found that more than half of all car seats inspected were incorrectly fitted. Worse still, 40% of children weren't restrained at all. Remember, a car seat isn't just an accessory. It's a vital piece of safety equipment. As children grow, they progress through four types of car seat. The right one depends on the exact size and weight of the child. So always weigh your child before buying a new one. Road safety officers at Dorset County Council have helped us with advice on choosing and fitting a car seat. We've used age only as a guide in this information to help you keep your kids safe on the road. From your baby's first journey until about nine months old, you should use a rearward facing seat to support your baby's head. But never use one in the front if there's an airbag on the passenger side. If it's triggered, the airbag could kill your baby. Children from about six months to about four years old should always be in a child seat. The safest place is on the passenger side, so you can help them in and out away from the traffic. Check the harness on every journey to allow for growth or simply a change of clothing. You should only be able to slide two fingers under the straps. With metal frame child seats, never allow the buckle of the car seat belt to lie across the metal frame. In an impact, the buckle will shatter. From about four to eight years old, your child may be too big to use a child seat, but is still too small for the adult seat belt to fit properly. A booster seat will give them the extra height they need and support their head. Until about 11, your child may still be too small for the adult seat belt. Use a booster cushion to lift them just enough for the belt to lie properly across their shoulder, not their neck, and around their pelvis, not their stomach. When you buy a child seat, it must have the British Standard Kite Mark or European Regulations Mark. If you have an accident, always replace the seat. Never buy second hand or even accept a seat from a friend unless you're absolutely certain of its history. A simple fault like a crack or a frayed harness will make it useless in an impact. When fitting a new seat, always follow the manufacturer's instructions carefully. Then grab the seat and shake it hard. If it moves, it's too loose. If you can, try your child in the seat and try the seat in your car before you buy it. Remember, keeping your kids safe on the road not only depends on how well the seat fits your child, but also on how well it fits into your car. To help you make the right choice, the RAC, in conjunction with Dorset County Council, has produced this leaflet. It includes a list of contact numbers for specific advice about your car seat. To get a copy, send a stamped addressed envelope to Child Seat Safety, P.O. Box 200, Walsall, WS5 4QZ. And we'll give you that address again at the end of the programme. Now, it's quite natural for children to be curious, to be inquisitive. But when it comes to playing around with fire, that natural curiosity can prove lethal. In 1994, fire services in the UK dealt with more than 3,000 fires that were caused by people just messing about. And it's quite clear that a great many more went unreported because they were put out before they got seriously out of hand. Now the fire services are putting a new emphasis on teaching children about the dangers of fire so that natural curiosity doesn't turn into a lethal habit. All children are excited about fire and they are curious about fire. Let's have some more. They will experiment, they will play with fire. That is quite a natural thing, but it's if they are going to go on and use that uh, knowledge of playing with fire as a tool for vandalism, anger, jealousy, whatever. Boys, stay where you are, and girls, crawl towards me. Crawl under the smoke. And fire safety lessons are a regular part of most children's schooling. Now, firefighters are developing new skills to help children who don't get the message. 
the preventative work that's done in school will reach the majority of children. There is always going to be the small percentage who, for one reason or another, they are going to need one-to-one -one work. Well, as part of your course... Uh, Shirley Toms, an educational psychologist, trains firefighters to counsel children who persistently play with fire. More than half of the UK's fire services now do this. What we're trying to do is set up a preventative, proactive work with the fire service that gives them the skills, the counselling skills, that they can go out there and work with families and with children. Would you like to tell me what it is you've been doing? Is it fire to bins? Role play is very important because it gives them opportunities to practice on each other. One of Shirley's first pupils was Ken Ashley. He's now one of 27 fire councillors in the West Midlands. I have seen over 80 children in the last four years and I know that the majority of those do not set fire any longer. I'm on my way to visit a young lad who I counselled some time ago and this, this visit today is, is a follow-up to find out whether he or his parents have any problems Hi, Ken. Hi, how are you doing? Hey. What's been going on? Not too bad, you know. Yeah, I'm doing fine now, after I've left my old school. He'd been messing with fire for a long time, and I was frightened that he was going to end up in trouble with the police. That's the reason I called them. I really do think he was fascinated by fire. And we looked at smoke alarms. You've got smoke alarms, haven't you? Yeah, we've got one there by the stairs. Yeah. This little incident was relatively minor, really. So what do you think the most important But if you compound them, you can see there was a pattern developing. He had lit a fire over the garages, uh, and we didn't find out until some time <coughs> later that it was him who started the fire with his friends. Stay on the ground, because of all the black smoke. When he had the visits off Ken, you could see that he was taking notice. So if you had to touch the handle to see whether it was hot? He now appreciates the danger of fire. Um, which I don't think he did before. Really got through to me and never let a fire since. <laughs> and he's like a fire yeah. marshal of the house now, like a fire monitor. And whenever he sees anything that he thinks is wrong, he, he's the first to tell us. Like, you know, so it's it's been beneficial to everybody, really. Fire setting is uh, increasing in our society and is affecting uh, youngsters, I believe as young as two and three years of age. With very young children, it's up to the family to protect them from danger until they're old enough to understand fire safety. Here, the fire was started by 16-month-old twin brothers playing with paper in an electric fire. They both died. Martin and Philip was fascinated by fire and we put them to bed that night. They must have play and put some in the fire. And they would come get into them, like the twins, because there's that much heat and smoke. Um, there's nothing we could do. I still, you know, I still I got out of it. I gave it through my mind. Every it happened, you know, I still think back. We could have stopped it. I mean, if I can just get it across to other parents, not to leave the lighters, matches, anything electrical what can hurt the children, then that will it's really pleased for me if I could do something like that. I mean, I wouldn't like anybody to get through what me and Sue's been through. <laughs> Not exactly Brands Hatch, but these would-be Damon Hills can reach speeds of up to 40 miles an hour, so safety is paramount. And on a professional track like this one, there are always trained first aiders around in case of minor accidents. Earlier this year, Ken Trotman and his teammates from the Cotswold Connection Skittles Club went on a go-karting trip for their annual outing. An unexpected event meant the afternoon could have ended in disaster if it wasn't for the swift action of two young lifesavers. In our reconstruction, we've used an actor to play Ken, but everybody else takes part as himself. A minibus picked us up. Ken was uh, sat in the front seat alongside the driver. Oh, shut up, Smithy! Ken is my wife's cousin. We've been friends for a long time. Here we go, here we go! We were all laughing and having a great time, really. Completely unaware of perhaps what was about to happen. I always like going to Gloucester Carton Centre, the racetrack, because I love Carton and I like helping my parents in the cafeteria. 
We were actually clearing away glasses from the previous Grand Prix we'd had, which was a big group, in the morning, ready for the Skittles team. I work part-time at Boston County Centre. That day I was asked to come in earlier than I was expected to. Hello Duncan, early on. Yeah, I actually work on reception there, taking customer orders, taking money, talking to customers. Hey, get out! Sorry. <laughs> okay. I don't say the one extra yeah. large. <laughs> Oh, about this one, I suppose, then. Good afternoon, gentlemen. Welcome to Gloucester Karting Centre. My name's Dan. I'll be your head marshal for this afternoon's race. You look like a good bunch, so I'm sure we're in for a good afternoon's racing. <laughs> Just a sec, we're going to go down onto the track and I'll show you some safety aspects. Marshals took us over to the uh, where all the flags were and showed us what the flags were, what they meant. Next up, and most importantly, is the red, gentlemen. If the red comes out, you simply stop. We were sat on the grid waiting for the lights to come on. For some reason I just just turned round and winked at Ken and put my thumb up and he done the same thing. And then all the red lights come on and you're waiting for the green and the tension is going then, it's beginning to build up. And all of a sudden the green light comes on and you're away. And it's foot hard down to that first corner. They all seem to be really enjoying themselves and having a good time. It was nice to see an older group actually karting because a lot of people think they're karting, oh, well, that's for a younger age group. <laughs> urging the cart to go as fast as possible and hopefully you get through the first bend. You're so low to the ground that it's something else really. And it was going great, we were having a great race. It was just very, very close all the way through. Just coming into the last bend, Ken sort of got in front and then all of a sudden just disaster struck. I knew it was an accident because the, all the red flags came out. Accidents happen quite often during Grand Prix races and it's not abnormal for them to stop the race and that's exactly what happened there. Fifteen-year-old Rebecca was one of the first people to reach Ken. It's got to be Ken. Go. Hello, sir, can you hear me? I first learnt my first aid at Army Cadets. I've been going for a year and I passed it on the 4th and 5th of February. Can you hear me? Sir, when I got over, he was really desperately trying to catch his breath. It was like he'd really badly winded himself. He was clutching hold of his chest. Quick, come for ambulance. Down the track. I rushed downstairs and that's the first time I actually saw what was going on. Take his arm off. No, don't. He may have a neck injury. He suddenly collapsed. Um, slid back in his seat and that's when I began to realise that something was was really wrong. He was not breathing at all. Becky confirmed that as well. They knew Ken would die if they couldn't resuscitate him. Rebecca had no choice but carefully to remove his helmet. I checked his pulse and there was nothing. Absolutely nothing at all. His lips turning blue. No, that's not a thing. Get him up and out the car. Right. Oh. I think Ken was gone really and I think I just just walked around in a daze, really. I think the first thing that came into my mind was, what do I say to Anne, his wife? Okay, everybody, stand back. He was dying, obviously, you know, and it was pretty critical that we were getting, going to do things as soon as we could. So we started mouth and mouth resuscitation and heart massage. My heart was just pounding, and when doing it on a real person, it's nothing like doing it in a practice. With a dummy, there's no features, you don't see their eyes open or closed. When you're doing it on a human being, things just run through your mind on, am I doing it right, am I not doing it right? I was having problems with giving him his breaths because as the heart had stopped, his muscles started to relax and he was swallowing his tongue. I'm not getting enough breath into him. I'll do the breaths, you do the compressions, okay? I could see the top of Ken's head was going blue and I, well, I just, I think I nearly sort of lost it then. I think, I think it was gone, you know, and that was it.
but Rebecca and Duncan, they just Two, didn't give three, up. Four, five. It seemed like forever before the ambulance came and as I was carrying on doing it, I was beginning to get tired. They seemed to me like they were doing um, a very good job. Ken was obviously um, in cardiac arrest. He was very blue. Once we secured Ken's airway, we went to work with some drugs. Then we shocked him a few times. Yeah. Shocking now. And we got him back. When I actually did step back and let the ambulance crew get on with their job, I just went and cried my eyes out because I'd gone into a state of shock myself. We got an output, really. Because Ken had been involved basically in a road accident as well, having crashed the car, we put him on a spinal board. Okay, hold it there. Where's that young girl gone? I looked around for Rebecca and Duncan. I wanted to thank them for what they'd done. Do you see what you can achieve if you get yourselves on a first aid course? In this crisis that we found ourselves in, none of us. None of us men knew what to do, which was a pretty awful thing, really. And it took two youngsters, really, to save, to save Ken's life. It is so important during cardiac arrest for an initial response. Something needs to be done right from the word go, or at least within two to three minutes. Otherwise, we're, we're not in with a chance at all. Ken needed three months of hospital treatment. I don't remember anything about the accident or where I was even. So, you know, it's just gone. It took a complete stranger to save his life. If it had happened in our home, I just would not have known what to do. I'm so shocked at what's happened. I asked the local hospital to do a resuscitation course for my family and friends because I just don't want to lose my husband. The most wonderful thing about it is the fact that if I hadn't have been there and Duncan hadn't have been there, Ken wouldn't have been living and it's, real, it's a real nice feeling to know that I've saved someone's life and so has Duncan. Just thankful to Rebecca and Duncan. And thankful I got a few more years with my family. And just thankful to be alive. Next week, a special Lifesavers programme tackles the tragedy of suicide among young people. Government statistics show that every year more than 700 people under 25 take their own lives. Now we often feel uncomfortable talking about death, but in many cases young people give out early warning signs about the way that they're feeling which aren't recognised. Young men are particularly vulnerable. For those aged between 15 and 24, the suicide rate has risen by 64% over the past 10 years. In Lifesavers next week, we'll tell the stories of two young people who tried to end their lives. We'll give information for young people on how to find the help they need and advice for family and friends on how to recognize and respond to suicidal talk. For your free copy of the Car Seat Safety Leaflet, send a stamped addressed envelope to Child Seat Safety, PO Box 200, Walsall, WS5, 4QZ. Dramatic stories of real-life rescue.